Hello, my smart and talented friends, and welcome to the Global Science Network. In the past three videos, we learned how to build artificial synapses, artificial neurons, and discussed how a single perceptron can be used to classify linearly separable data in both 2D and 3D. The goal of these videos is to understand the fundamentals of circuits and neural networks so we can then build hardware-based neural networks that will change the world. A single perceptron was able to solve the AND, OR, NAND, and NOR logic gates where the training is done using the perceptron learning rule. These cases are linearly separable where a line can separate the class 0 and class 1 points. The XOR and XNOR logic gates are not linearly separable, so we will need to use a multi-layered network that is trained using backpropagation. This training process involves sequential mathematical operations that must be performed in order for the network to learn. There are quite a few steps, and to simplify the learning process, I made one single table that contains all the information we will need to know. We will go through each step in this video, and we will learn how the network is trained to solve the XOR case. The multi-layered network will allow two classes to be separated by a complex decision boundary. If you look at this decision boundary plot, you can see that class 1 and class 0 points were separated in a way that each point is properly classified. However, the boundary is still not what I would consider to be ideal. We are going to need to add noise or variation to the input values to see if we can improve the decision boundary. The noise makes the boundary better, but for an ideal case, the top left corner should be all red, which is class 1. So right now, the model would say that a very noisy point located here is class 0, but class 1 would be a better match. Just adding more variation to the input value still does not quite get us to the ideal solution. The decision boundary can be improved if we add more variation to the input values and improve the neural network by adding more neurons. In fact, we get this decision boundary, which is almost ideal for the XOR logic gate. The XOR case is a perfect example to help a person understand the fundamentals of neural networks because it uses most of the complex math but can be solved using only three input neurons, two hidden neurons, and one output neuron. The architecture diagram for a single perceptron may look like there are three input neurons and an output neuron, but it actually just represents one neuron where the neuron's body encompasses the summation and activation function. Within the body, the neuron computes the weighted sum z and then passes that z value through the activation function. The result of the activation function is the output of the neuron. In most neural network architecture diagrams, this entire process is simply represented as a circle. To solve the XOR case, we will need to use multi-layered neural networks shown here. The network starts with what are called input neurons, although these aren't true neurons since they simply pass forward their input values. There are two input neurons, X1 and X2, and a bias neuron, X0, which equals 1. The hidden layer has two neurons with sigmoid activation functions. The output layer has one neuron and also uses a sigmoid activation function. In a forward pass, neurons in both the hidden and output layers calculate a weighted sum z, which is then passed through their activation function to produce the output value. Each neuron in these layers follows this two-step process, computing the weighted sum and applying the activation function to determine its output. The neurons in this architecture diagram shows the math of the forward pass two different ways. First, H1 is calculated by setting z equal to the summation, or weighted sum, which is passed into the activation function. Or it can be written as h1 equals the sigmoid activation function applied to the weighted sum. This is not the sigmoid function times the weighted sum, which is what it would be if it was an algebraic expression. So in a forward pass, the inputs, biases, and weights are used to calculate the weighted sum in the hidden layer. The weighted sum is then passed through the activation function to produce the hidden layer outputs. These hidden layer outputs, along with their associated weights and biases, are used to calculate the weighted sum for the output neuron. Finally, the weighted sum passes through the activation function to produce the network's predicted output. It should now seem straightforward as to how a forward pass calculates and predicts the output. The real question now is how do we train the network to learn to properly classify the XOR case? This is done in a multi-step process. I created this large table that outlines all the math and mathematical derivations necessary for training the network. Before diving right into the table of formulas, let's first use the architecture diagram to examine and visualize the process. The network's training process starts with random weights and biased values. A forward pass is performed to get the predicted output y hat. The input values are going to be ideal values from the XOR case. So these will be 1, 1, where y equals 0, 0, 1, where y equals 1, 1, 0, where y equals 1, or 0, 0, where y equals 0. 
When the network trains on all four of these cases, it is considered one epoch. The network typically requires around 10,000 epochs to converge. This means that it will process 40,000 input cases during training. After the forward pass is performed, the cost function then calculates the error based on the predicted value. Now the backpropagation process starts. The output error gradient is the derivative of the cost function times the derivative of the sigmoid function. The derivatives result in the simple mathematical equation. Note that while the piecewise operation symbol typically indicates an element-wise operation across a matrix, in this case, we're working with scalar values, so it simply represents multiplication. Since we're using the derivative of the sigmoid function, let's look at its visual representation. The graph shows both the sigmoid function, which is the blue line, and its derivative, which is the red line. Note that the derivative of the sigmoid function reaches its maximum value of 0.25 when the sigmoid function passes through 0. To calculate the hidden layer error gradient, three terms are multiplied together. The output error gradient, the corresponding weight, and the derivative of the sigmoid function. From there, we are now ready to calculate the change in weight values, which will be used to adjust the old weight values into the new weights. For the output layer, the change in weight, V1, is calculated as the product of three terms, the learning rate, the output layer error gradient, and H1. The new weight is calculated by taking the current weight, V1, and subtracting this change in V1. For the hidden layer, the process is similar. The change in weight, W11, is calculated as the product of three terms, the learning rate, the hidden layer error gradient, and X1. The new weight is calculated by taking the current weight, W11, and subtracting this change in W11. This process is repeated to update all the remaining weights. The network then receives new input values x1 and x2, and the entire training cycle repeats until there is convergence. These plots show how the weights evolved as the number of epochs increased. The network required approximately 10,000 epochs to converge on a solution. For this simple neural network, a decision boundary was found that now properly classifies all the points. Now that we've visualized the backpropagation process, let's examine the detailed mathematical steps using this table. The table provides both the equations and a numerical example to help clarify how the equations are used. The top of the table shows the equations for a forward pass, starting with inputs x1 and x2. We compute the weighted sum, which is also called a linear combination for z1 and z2. These z values are then passed through the sigmoid function to produce the hidden layer outputs h1 and h2. Similarly, for the output layer, we calculate another weighted sum, z3, and pass it through the sigmoid function to obtain the final output, y hat. Next, we calculate the cost function, which is the square of the difference between the actual y value and the predicted y value. While plotting the cost function helps visualize convergence, it isn't directly used in backpropagation. Instead, we use its derivative. The mean error per epoch, shown in this example equation, provides another way to track convergence by averaging the errors across all four XOR cases. Next, we calculate the error derivatives beginning with the output layer. The partial derivative of y hat is taken with respect to z3. This is equivalent to the derivative of the sigmoid function with respect to z3. We previously looked at this plot showing the sigmoid function and the derivative of the sigmoid function. The result for the derivative of the sigmoid function is a basic algebraic expression, which is the predicted output y hat times the result of 1 minus the predicted output. The hidden layer error derivative is also found by taking the derivative of the sigmoid function. The resulting equation has the same form but uses the hidden layer output h1 rather than y hat. These error derivatives will now be used to find the error gradients. For the output layer, we need to take the partial derivative of the error with respect to z3. Since this cannot be calculated directly, we apply the chain rule, which takes the derivative of the error with respect to y hat and multiplies it by the derivative of y hat with respect to z3. This simplifies to the product of the error derivative times the derivative of the sigmoid function. This output layer error gradient can be shown graphically to help visualize the chain rule. The graph shows three key components a blue line representing the derivative of the cost function, an orange line representing the derivative of the sigmoid function, and a green line displaying their product, which represents the chain rule solution and resulting output layer error gradient. The top graph is for when the target output is y equals 0, and the bottom graph is for when the target output is y equals 1. The output layer error gradient back propagates and is used to calculate the hidden layer gradient. 
This gradient, delta H1, is the partial derivative of the error with respect to Z1. Since this cannot be calculated directly, we again apply the chain rule. The result is the product of three terms, the output layer gradient, which is delta out, the weight, V1, and the derivative of the sigmoid function. Next, we calculate the weight gradients for both layers with the derivative shown here. The chain rule is needed again, and the simplified results are shown here. For the output layer, the weight gradients equal the output layer air gradient times the corresponding hidden layer output, H1 or H2. For the hidden layer, the weight gradients equal the hidden layer air gradients times the corresponding input, X1 or X2. With the weight gradients calculated, we can now update the weights using two steps. First, the change in weights are found by multiplying the learning rate times the weight gradient times the output value of the corresponding neuron. Second, take the current weight value and subtract the change in weight. Now we have the updated weight for that training input. Note that the minus sign in the weight updates is important because we're moving in the negative direction of the gradient to minimize error. This is because the gradient is the direction of the steepest increase in the error function. Also note that the magnitude of the weight gradient is the slope or steepness in that direction. The updated biases are also found by taking the current bias and subtracting the change in that bias. With updated weights and biases, we can now proceed to our next training point. Our network began with an initial error of 0.5, and after 10,000 epochs, the error reduced to 0.018, indicating convergence to a solution. This network implements stochastic gradient descent, which is online learning, updating weights after each individual training example, in contrast to batch gradient descent, which updates weights using all training data from an epoch. In this case, one training set, or epoch, would be the four possible cases for XOR, which are shown here. For batch gradient descent, all four training examples are processed simultaneously through matrix operations, and the weights are updated based on the combined error from all examples at once. An example of this is shown here. For example, change in V1. It goes from this equation to this equation. We are now multiplying the learning rate times the summation of weight gradients for all the cases in this batch. I did program this XOR example using both stochastic and batch gradient descent and got very similar results as both were able to find a valid solution. Stochastic and batch gradient descent typically achieve similar training outcomes. However, with larger training sets, modern neural network implementations commonly use mini batch gradient descent, which updates weights based on a subset of inputs. Using batch sizes of 32, 64, or 128 allows hardware accelerators, such as GPUs, TPUs, and NPUs, to optimize parallel processing. These batch sizes enable efficient matrix operations, significantly improving the computational speed to train the network. Now that we understand the process, let's look at the results. The neural network went from these initial weights and biases to these final weights and biases. Once training converges and the weights and biases are finalized, we can visualize the network's decision boundary by running forward passes across a grid of points in the x1, x2 coordinate plane. We create a contour plot showing the model's classification confidence. Dark red regions indicate strong confidence for class 1, while dark blue shows strong confidence for class 0. This filled contour plot demonstrates the network has successfully learned the XOR function, accurately classifying points near the training data. We can add variation to the training inputs to see if we can get a better contour plot. The decision boundary improves with the initial addition of variation and continues to improve as we add more variation. Eventually though, adding more variation of the inputs does not improve the results because the simple network cannot create a complex enough decision boundary to achieve the ideal classification pattern. One attempt to improve the network's performance was to increase the number of neurons in the hidden layer from 2 to 10. This produced acceptable results, however, it still did not achieve the ideal case. Even adding 20 neurons did not find the ideal case. Then I tried adding a second hidden layer. The first and second hidden layers both had two neurons, and the output still had one neuron. This architecture achieved excellent results, producing a near-ideal decision boundary. You can see that the four possible outcomes are basically broken into the four quadrants. The network with two by two hidden layers did not always give the ideal case, though so the results were inconsistent. Increasing to four neurons in each hidden layer provided more reliable results. Understanding the XOR case provides the foundation for exploring more complex neural networks.
to watch the next video where we will implement more advanced neural networks, click here.